you're fine just now. Okay. All right. Okay, great. Well, I'm Malcolm Hull. I'm the, the branch chair for Hearts and Middlesex Butterfly Conservation. Um, thanks very much to everybody for um, dialing in this evening. I can see we've just got up to 50 attendees, which is brilliant. Um, oh, and some more people just um, coming in at present um, who I shall let in. Um, we've got um, Andrew Wood here this evening who's going to speak to us, but just before we get on to that, it's just a couple of things I'd like to mention. Um, we are recording this talk um, and there will be a recording um, of this and also um, as, as of the other, as there are with the other talks on the uh, homepage of Branch website. Uh, but if you can, um, if you can, if you want to, if you want to watch it again, or um, if someone else hasn't seen it, or you'd like to see any of the other talks, then if you go onto the, the branch website homepage, then you shall you will find them there. Um, we've got um, uh, a couple of other events coming up. Most importantly, our uh, members' day, which is our, our next event, which is on um, Saturday, the twenty seventh of March. That will be sort of two to five p.m. So it's a bit of a longer event, uh, but we will be having um, breaks in between it. So it's not not going to be an elongated Zoom session that you you'll have to mm -hmm. suffer. Um, I think what we'll we've we've got some great speakers and we've sent round um, details of them. So I won't I won't describe all them all. But uh, Phil Sterling, who's been leading Butterfly Conservation's um, uh, projects to building butterfly sites around the country will be speaking um, and also Zoe Randall who's um, uh, written the the or joint author of a leading book about moths so it, it will be, should be a very interesting session we hope um, as many of you as possible can um, can dial into that uh, and all the links should be on the emails we sent around and on the branch website. Um, I want just two other things the photo competition for the um, that we have at the same time as the as the uh, members day um, that that's still open for entries um, up until the 20th of March um, you can enter by emailing the photos to to Andrew Wood and all the rules of the the competition are on the uh, the website although um, that we tend to interpret them fairly loosely um, and just one other thing, um, we've arranged an additional winter tour because they've been so popular so far. Um, and we've got uh, Roger Gibbons, who'll be returning to speak on uh, the French connection, Butterflies of France. And that will be on uh, Wednesday, the 31st of March. And that I know Roger's uh, probably the leading expert on French butterflies in this country. And that should be a really excellent talk. So another one for your diaries. Um, Tonight's talk, um, Andrew Wood, um, probably needs no introduction to most of you, our county butterfly recorder, um, also very active in the Hearts and Middlesex moth group and does a lot of work uh, looking after their records as well. Um, he's probably seen more um, butterfly records for Hertfordshire and Middlesex than any other person alive. Um, and so is ideally placed to talk to us on the subject. Um, Andrew, over to you. Thanks, Malcolm. Distorting through. Anyway, let's see if I can share the screen. Right. Can everyone see the screen all right? I can see it, yeah. Uh, brilliant, okay and uh, yell or do something if, if you can't hear me, because I know I started off a bit quiet last time. But, uh, let's see what we've got. So yeah, one year of butterfly and moth records, uh, 2020. That's a slightly misleading title in that I will indeed be looking at those, but I should also be looking at them over a longer period of time in order to make some comparisons uh, and so on. waiting for it to move on. Uh -huh. it. It, is a, it is a little bit quiet, Andrew. I don't know if you can okay, get okay. just slightly closer. Yeah, fine. Right, so this is, this is first of all, we're going to concentrate on butterfly records and then talk about the moth records uh, in a little while. So I thought it was worth just enumerating because this is something we don't normally publish. Um, 
where all our butterfly records actually come from. And just to explain, a butterfly record is a record of a species on a day at a particular site. Um, and so it's one record, whether it's 400 chalk hill blues or one large tortoise shell at the same place. So you can see that um, something like 40% of the records actually come from the three weeks of the big butterfly count, which is uh, Butterfly Conservation's uh, big citizen science project in the uh, late latest summer, late July and early August. This is clear. Right? Um, these records are quite useful in that they often fill in a lot of gaps. I think because we're particularly urban, obviously, particularly in Middlesex, Greater London, there are a lot of people who record in their gardens in that area, but don't send in records otherwise. And so they help to fill in a lot of gaps on the map for our distribution numbers. Um, then the next one's down, um, about half that number, are what I call casual records. And they are records that people send in to me um, either as spreadsheets or sometimes it's just odd emails. And it also includes uh, my records through the year. Uh, I generally make round about three, three and a half thousand in a year. Um, then third and rapidly rising up the chart is iRecord, which covers three applications. iRecord, iRecord butterflies and the, uh, the, the fairly newly launched um, national, oh gosh, I can't think what it's called now. But they're, they're all basically um, uh, cloud applications, both for Android and uh, Apple devices. Um, and a lot of people are using those now to enter their records. It's useful to me because it enables people to add photographs as well, which quite a number of people do, which can help to verify uh, whether the record is as uh, they suggest it is. And I actually go through all those records and uh, as the official verifier, go through and say yay or nay, or ask a question before those are admitted to the uh, county database. Then coming down the list, we have transect records. These are important because these are the sort of 50, 60, 70, depending on the year, uh, regularly walked routes all the way from April to September, once a week um, in ideal conditions, where people record butterflies uh, in a set way on a set route. And these are important because these are what give us our abundance records. Because they're very comparable from year to year, we can actually see uh, whether butterfly numbers are actually increasing or decreasing um, without just saying, someone saying, oh, I've seen a lot more of this than I saw last year, or don't think these were very common. This actually gives us some solid data to uh, base our records on. And these, have, these transects, some of them have been going for 40 years most of them more recently than that. And these are an important scientific database throughout the country. Then we have about 4,000 records which are submitted to the branch website and appear on the news page. And uh, these go into a database courtesy of Peter Clark who runs that site. Um, and again, I, go to, I download that database, have a quick look through them and uh, put those on. Then we have the wider countryside butterfly survey, which is a more limited effort uh, survey, which a number of people do in particular randomly selected squares um, across the two counties. About half of them are butterfly conservation squares and about half of them come from the BTO's um, a BTO survey, British Trust for Ornithology survey, which also includes butterflies. And that gives us a total of 62,091 records, which is a record. Um, so, you know, that's brilliant. As was the fact that altogether, those records are contributed by 3,477 different recorders, which is pretty impressive. Okay, so where were our records made or not made? So we've got a, a few maps. I should explain but on these maps, what you're seeing is the outline of Hertfordshire and Middlesex. Um, and each of the dots or represents a two kilometer square. So the whole county, both counties are divided up into these two kilometer squares based on the Ordnance Survey National Grid. And the uh, 
this there are about 640 650 of these which cover all or some of our two counties and so these two charts here give you an idea of the coverage so on the in the middle of the screen the number of species in 2020 this shows us the hot spots and the cold spots in, in one particular way so the big red blobs are the places where people recorded getting on for 25 30 species and they're not surprising places apart from one so on the left hand side we have almost brown we have albury knowers which is probably the best butterfly site in the two counties and then if we go north a bit across the uh, wastelands of bedfordshire we see another red dot on the edge of the county that's another wildlife trust reserve hexton chalk pit which again is a very good place for butterflies and then right at the top of the map you'll see two brown a red and an orange uh, blob forming a square and that's Fairfield Heath, which is another classic site for butterflies. Um, down um, a bit further, the, the dark spots, um, about equal with Albury Noah's, but across to the middle of the map, those are Hartwood Forest. The, uh, the, the, what, the Woodland Trust recently created a rewilding, woodlanding area of formerly arab, mainly arable farmland that there are some pre-existing woodlands um, and that's proving to be a very good site for butterflies. Um, down from that into middle, just into Middlesex is another very dark red blob. That's, um, that's Ricelit Woods, which is, again is a classic butterfly site. Um, then going across from that in North, East, North London, there is another blo block of reddish brown spots. That's Alexandra Palace Park, um, so well into London there. That's an exceptionally well surveyed um, park. There are several people sending hundreds and hundreds of records from there. And there is also a transect. Um, and so the, yeah, the big amount of recording effort pays off there. And talking of big amounts of recording effort, you'll notice if you go north from there, there are a whole load of red blobs in what is actually East Hertfordshire. And that is the Hartford and Ware area. And this again shows what can happen, and this particularly is thanks to COVID-19, what can happen if people survey intensively in one particular area. These records represent almost daily exercise walks through the year by myself and even more so by Liz Goodyear, uh, rec recording butterflies within a few kilometres of our houses. And yeah, they're not really particular hot spots compared to anywhere else in the county, but they just do underline what recorder effort can do. And that brings me on to the map on the right hand side, which shows the number of species in uh, each of these squares and areas where we haven't, sorry, the number of species, the small number of species have been recorded in some squares. And so on this one, the absence of a dot means it's a well recorded area. So you can see that that square where Liz and I live is very well recorded because there's only two areas that have got fewer than 10 species recorded. But there are quite a lot of other areas where only small numbers have been recorded. Um, you can, there's a whole load dotted around the border and sometimes that's because only a tiny amount of that square is actually in Hertfordshire or Middlesex. Um, so, you know, it's excusable, there aren't many records necessarily from there, but there are quite a few areas, uh, particularly the, the, um, the larger sort of flesh coloured, salmon coloured blobs, uh, where we have yet to get records. Um, and, well, no, we haven't yet to get records, but in our 2020 to 2024 five year recording period, um, we have yet to get any records, so they are particular target areas. And I know these maps don't include a particular context, um, which I can give you now, um, which shows where particular towns and urban areas are. Um, and I'd be very willing if anyone wants to know if the area around them uh, is badly recorded or is a particular target area for somewhere near them, I'd be very happy if they drop me a line to give them an idea of what, what is available, what or you know, an area that it would be really worth surveying. Okay, let's move on 
to some species. Now, I'm, I'm not going to go, what I should say, I'm not going to sit here and read the annual report to you, you'll be pleased to hear. But what I am going to do is pick out a few species where there are interesting trends or things that I want to speak about um, and, uh, and just highlight them. So the first one is the brown hair streak, which is a recent addition to the fauna of Middlesex. Now, it was first detected uh, in, in Middlesex, right down in the southwest, which you can see is where a lot of records still are, about four years ago, um, and has been in fairly intensive surveying um, of that area and moving up into Middlesex by a number of different people um, who spent a lot of time mainly looking for eggs because this species is quite elusive. Um, it's quite hard to see in the summer, uh, but the eggs are relatively easy to find in the winter. They, um, they're laid on blackthorn, usually at the junction of uh, two twigs. And the eggs, as you can see from the photograph down below, are very round, very exquisitely marked and shaped, and they're very distinctive. There's one moth, the blue bordered carpet, which shares blackthorn as its food plant, but its eggs tend to be laid in pairs and they tend to be rather more sort of blobby looking than this very finely delineated uh, egg. So they're quite easy to tell apart. Once you get, you've got to get your eye in though. If it was as easy as all that, then we'd probably have more records. The exciting thing is that right at the end of the year, you can see that there is an orange dot right on what is the border between Hertfordshire and Middlesex in the uh, Darlands Lake Totteridge Fields area. And that represents the furthest north and east that we've de detected the brown hair streak. And that was just at the end of 2020. Um, so there's obviously a good chance that we may be able to detect it moving into Hertfordshire. It's been moving up through Surrey and, and hence into, into southwest Middlesex over the last few years. Um, and anywhere where there is a lot of blackthorn, and there is a lot of blackthorn around, particularly younger, younger shoots of it where it hasn't been slashed back as part of uh, hedge management, um, may, may harbour this very attractive species. It's slightly larger, I would say, than the other hair streaks. And it's also one of the latest butterflies in our area to start flying. Normally, in a good, in a warm year, it starts flying towards the end of July, but generally its flight period is August and September. Unfortunately, there are quite a number of other small butterflies which can be confused with it, such as the gatekeeper, the small copper, the brown hair streak, because you don't very often see it that close up. And they can sometimes behave like it does, flying around blackthorn and, and especially ash trees where they're associated with blackthorn hedges. But uh, this is all very, very encouraging news, especially when you think that there were no historic records of brown hair streak in Middlesex until a few years ago. Okay, um, the small blue, uh, this, this is another success story. This butterfly um, was reckoned to be extinct in Hertfordshire about 20 years ago. It lived, the last colonies lived on what remained of the old Hitchin to Bedford railway line in an area called Ickleford, just north of Hitchin. And basically that, <clears throat> that, that environment deteriorated to the extent that a, a few young a uh, few larvae were seen and then that was it. And then a few years ago at um, Butterfly World as was, uh, a large amount of its food plant, uh, uh, sorry, larval food plant, um, kidney vetch was planted and they appeared there in numbers, presumably because there was some sort of locally relict population which had managed to live undetected in the area. And since then, we again assiduous searching by various volunteers of the branch um, has detected the uh, small blue, generally in chalky areas, because, but not entirely, because that's what kidney vetch um, favours, um, across quite a wide swathe of West, West Hertfordshire. Um, the odd records have turned up in other places. The, the blue circles represent 2015 to 19. So some of those records were actually 2019, so it doesn't mean it's actually necessarily disappeared from those areas, but it's a very, it's our smallest butterfly and it tends to exist only in quite small colonies, 
uh, generally the butterfly world was a huge colony but most of the colonies that you see now in places like um, just outside Letchworth uh, off a road called Hillbrow and the fields there uh, our numbers is doing well if you see 20 or 30 but uh, a success story and the good thing is that when the Bulldog bypass was built the A505 around the side of Bulldog a lot of planting was done on the uh, cuttings of kidney vetch in the hope that they would they would um, appear there basically um, and the nearest site for them has turned out to be Hillbrow where they were first found about seven years ago now I think um, and it was two years ago that one finally appeared in some kidney vetch right at the southern end of the bypass and then this year finally two were seen in the big area of kidney vetch that's been planted on a lot of the chalk that was uh, dug out to form the cutting and the tunnels and dumped just north of Clothall Common on the uh, north eastern side, sorry, on the eastern side of um, Bulldock. So we're hoping that uh, they're probably present with any luck along that uh, bypass now. The trouble is, although it's only an A road because it's got tunnels on it, it's strictly forbidden for anyone to go over the fence and walk along what are very steep cuttings with a, a busy dual carriageway in the bottom. So surveying has never been that easy. It's always been confined to looking at the tops of the uh, cuttings and looking down from bridges. But uh, so, yeah, it's, it's looking good. OK, marbled white. Now, just sort of show you a little bit of video. This was a good year for marbled white 2020. This was a patch of vettles. Oh, only about half a mile from my house, just outside uh, Benjo, where there were about 30 or 40 all nectaring on the um, spear plume thistles. And then there's just a still to show you what, what this butterfly looks like. I'm sure many of you are now familiar with it. And I've just got a little run of maps to show you how it has really spread across the county over the last um, 80 years, in fact. So the map that's showing at the moment shows its status all the way from 1940 to 1990. And you'll see that with a few exceptions, it's very much confined to the chalky areas of West Hertfordshire, one or two other records here and there. So that was right up from the 50 years up to 1990. Then from 1991 to 2000, it started to really spread. <clears throat> you can see that the number of sightings in the chalky areas increased and that it started to spread uh, out going east and south from that, that sort of heartland area. Then 2001 to 2005, um, again, slightly, slow, slightly slower spread perhaps, but beginning to pop up in odd places right across Hertfordshire and Middlesex. <clears throat> 2006 to 2010, it's filling in, even getting into East Hertfordshire, um, more widely in North Hertfordshire, and <clears throat> appears to have jumped the arable desert and to become quite well recorded around the Bishop Stortford area in the east. And then we have its tw 2011 to 2015 occurrence, where you can see it's filling in even more gaps. And now apart from South East Middlesex, which is really the most built up parts of central London, um, and one or two bits still of East Hertfordshire where there is a lot of large arable fields. It's uh, pretty well covering everywhere. And um, then 2016 to 2020, you can see that it's really become an extremely well distributed butterfly. Lots of deep reds showing that there were quite good colonies. <clears throat> and the only area it hasn't colonized is right down in Southwest Middlesex probably because most of the air is actually Heathrow Airport and the associated um, industry, light industry and warehousing and distribution down there. So this really is a success. It's gone from being quite a rare and sought after butterfly to being one that you can expect to turn up pretty well anywhere. I mean, it turns up in our back garden, suburban back garden now from time to time. And that was just at the bottom of that inset of the actual 2020 map, 
showing obviously there's still a lot of squares. It's only one year of a survey, but uh, well distributed. So Purple Emperor, this is probably still most people's prize butterfly to see. Um, <coughs> and you can see those, those all the circles show it's actually a very well distributed butterfly now, particularly in Hertfordshire and one or two bits along the border with Middlesex and one or two sites into London. Um, the, I don't pay too much attention to the fact that there's only a certain number of, of dots for 2020. It turned, there are one or two hot spots where it could be relied on, like in the Rice Lit Woods, North or Great Wood, um, Roxbourne Woods, but um, it can turn up pretty well anyway. Although we tend to think of it as a woodland butterfly, it actually roams far and wide across uh, the whole countryside. And for instance, uh, at the top right hand corner, you can see there's a yellow dot, which is Patmore Heath, which is about as far as you can get from any major blocks of woodland um, in the county. I mean, there are there are some trees there, but not a great number. Um, so and it turns up in people's back gardens. It's one of those butterflies you can set out to find it and you may be lucky or you can hope to, you can stumble upon it and you're just as likely to be lucky almost. Um, but just to show how difficult it can be to see if you don't spend, if you're not one of the people who likes to spend hours looking up with binoculars at tall trees. I'm the butterfly recorder, as I say, I go out and I visit all over the two counties. I haven't seen an adult purple emperor for two years. But yeah, I know they're still around. And this is the White Admiral, which is one of the other three big woodland butterflies that we have in our area. But this one is very pretty well strictly confined to woodland, though there was a a strange uh, occurrence of one dead on a pavement in New Southgate, which is the yellow dot on the uh, eastern side of the map down in um, Middlesex. Um, and that is not doing well. So we've had a few success stories. The White Admiral certainly isn't a success story. It's strictly confined really to woodland. Um, the two strongholds have traditionally been Bricket Wood in southwest Hertfordshire and Bulls Wood in east Hertfordshire. It seems to be doing better at Bulls Wood at the moment than Bricket Wood, though both of them, the numbers are down from the peaks of a few years ago. To some extent, it's a cyclical butterfly, um, but it's not just a drop in um, distribution across Hertfordshire and Middlesex. It's also something that seems to be happening across a lot of the country. Not entirely sure why. It may be something to do with climate, or it may be to do with the fact that it requires shady honeysuckle to breed. If you walk through a wood, you'll often see some really lush honeysuckle along the rides. And a lot of woodlands have been quite well managed in recent years. So they've gained these um, wide woodland rides with the lush honeysuckle at the side. But the, uh, it means the number of shadier areas perhaps where the, the sort of straggly, fairly nasty looking honeysuckle, which they actually like, um, is growing has, has perhaps declined a bit and there is perhaps I couldn't give you any actual factual evidence but there does seem to be a decline in woodlands which have been perhaps slightly too heavily managed they do need the open areas for nectaring but they also need the shady areas for egg laying and mating and so on okay the golden skippers are the uh, small skipper, the Essex skipper and the large skipper, uh, all grassland butterflies, though you will find the large skipper in woodlands. And you can see that they're all fairly well distributed across the uh, counties. But in each, or each case, the numbers of squares that are occupied seems to be dropping or staying fairly constant, but usually with a downward, a general downward trend and the number of butterflies that are actually seen at any one location tends to be lower uh, than it was. And so we've, we've got some concern about all these three species. It's uh, not entirely clear why, um, like, like many things with butterflies and natural, natural world generally, but there are three species to keep an eye out for. Of course, it doesn't help that the small skipper and the Essex skipper are quite difficult to distinguish. Those of you 
who were at Sir Roger's talk a couple of weeks ago will now have a much better idea of uh, how to distinguish the two. And I hope we'll get lots of definite records uh, coming in in 2021. Now the small tortoise shell, uh, this was a butterfly that there was a lot of concern about a few years ago. The numbers seem to be plunging. It was blamed on a parasitic fly called Sturmia bella that had uh, reached this country from Europe um, and was uh, causing a lot of problems parasitizing uh, the younger, the early stages of the butterfly. Um, it seems to have recovered. In fact, the recovery seemed to start a little bit earlier in our area than it did in some other parts of the country. And at the moment, it's still a well distributed and reasonably common uh, butterfly, thank goodness, because it is such an attractive species. And you can see that in 2020, uh, we, you know, there's pretty good coverage across the whole county. Now, the painted lady, I put this one in because, as we know, it's a, it's a migrant um, in 99.99% in of cases, anyhow. Um, <clears throat> but 2019 was something of a painted lady year. And although that was mainly in the north, more to the north of the country, we also got a fair number of records, as you can see from the 2019 map. Now, if you look at 2020, you can see it was much less common and uh, 2020 was not a painted lady year. Uh, there were there were an odd one, and you can see that most of the records were one site, sighting or two sighting. There weren't large numbers seen in any particular place. Um, and this is this is just part of the general uh, cycle of painted ladies that you may get a painted lady year once in ten years. It really depends on the weather conditions down in uh, northern Africa. Uh, it, during the winter and what their breeding success is down there and how they then manage to progress in waves across Europe before hitting Britain. So um, I just put that in to show the contrast between a painted lady year and a non-painted lady year. Chalk Hill Blue is another of our Chalk Hill Chalkland specialists and you can see that from the map that basically if you want to find chalk in Hertfordshire you go along the northern border, which is, forms part of the Chiltern Hills. So, but I do want to draw your attention to a couple of things. Uh, let's look at the red blobs. We've got Albury Noahs uh, yet again in the west, and then we've got Hexton Chalk Pit on that little uh, crab's claw area sticking out a bit further to the east. Um, and then we've got the four blobs representing Fairfield Heath. And these are all the very well established colonies. This is one of the things where you can, it's very easy to distinguish abundance from distribution because based on distribution, this is a rare butterfly in our area, but in all those places, it's abundance. You'll see dozens and dozens, you can't miss it. It's not one of those things you have to search for and poke around. The two blobs that I haven't mentioned, which lay between Fairfield Heath and Hexton Chalk Pit are the most interesting ones. <clears throat> one of those is Ashwell Quarry, um, and that wasn't known there until 2013, when there was a huge explosion of Chalk Hill Blues in the county. And colonies like Fairfield Heath and Hexton Chalk Pit literally were bursting at the seams. And butterflies, particularly males, um, spread out. And there were records across the whole county and even into Middlesex, though some of those may have come up from Surrey. There were about 20 or 30 sites where the Chalk Hill Blue was seen miles away from Chalk and from its food plant, um, Horseshoe Vetch. But there was Horseshoe Vetch at Ashwell Quarry and they settled there and there's now a small colony which has survived for seven years there. And just to the south, we're in, again looking at the um, chalk spoil dumped from the Boldock Bypass, which was planted uh, again with Horseshoe Vetch, um, particularly along the cuttings. And nothing happened there until three years ago when Chalk Hill Blue was seen. And each year now, more and more have been seen. And certainly last year, there were, I certainly went up there and counted about 40 in one day, um, as far as I could distinguish 40 different individuals. So that seems to be a thriving colony. Um, so it's good news that they are able to colonize new areas of their food plant. Um, and we assume that the ones at 
Baldock. Well, they may have come from Ashwell, which isn't that too far away, but there is a lot of very blank arable field between the two. But they may have found their way down the uh, Baldock bypass, which um, is the A505, as I mentioned, which connects Royston down to Baldock. And the cuttings and so on along there may have provided sufficient food plants for them to be progressing down that rather busy road quietly and then to have found a very, um, a very comfortable place to rest uh, just north of Clothall Common. So well worth going to sing because it's a very accessible place. Okay, small copper. A few years ago, we were very concerned about the small copper. It hadn't had a good year across anywhere. Um, but it now seems to have recovered and if anything, having recovered is increasing quite considerably. And you can see it's well distributed. Uh, and apart from the very urban area of West, you know, in the West London, the West End and so on, it's well distributed both across Middlesex and Hertfordshire. So it, it doesn't mind urban areas anywhere as some grassland with sorrel growing. There's now a very good chance of seeing this attractive little butterfly. And then we have the small heath, which we made, or I made the cover star of our annual report this year, for the, for the purely for the reason that it seems to be popping up in greater numbers everywhere. It likes uh, relatively short, fine grasses. Uh, it's not too bothered whether they're on uh, chalk or acid or neutral soil. Um, and it seems to be occurring in more and more new squares. So some of these square, obviously there are squares where we didn't record it last year, but some of these squares which are colored in uh, are, are new squares for the year and again you can see that in that area around Hertfordshire uh, sorry but around Hartford and where where all but four of the squares have, have, have got it recorded um, and it certainly seems to be enjoying conditions at the moment it's attractive little but occurs in colonies so if you see one you like to see a dozen so it's quite easy to find never never rests with its wings open though occasionally you may catch it with its wings open just as it starts flying. Um, and uh, it, it's great that that does seem to be doing very well now. It's never considered one of our commoner brown butterflies. Okay, we now come on to some controversies. Nothing like a bit of controversy to liven things up. And this is the Adonis blue, a beautiful, beautiful butterfly, probably the bluest most shiny iridescent blue butterfly that we have in this country and it's extinct in Hertfordshire has been for quite a long time um, except it isn't extinct in Hertfordshire because in 2019 there were reports of some being seen at particularly on Thurfield Heath particularly at the site called Church Hill and they were released in one of the areas it appears they've been released in one of the areas which was one of the last places where they were found by someone person or persons unknown as the police would say who knows a lot about how what they need to thrive they were they were around in just the right place for, in terms of food plant warmth uh, aspect and so on because it's one of the few parts of Furfield Heath that actually gets the south face gets the sun on it because most of Furfield Heath faces north we don't know who did it. We don't know where they've come from. Um, and there's certainly no authorization from English nature or from anyone else. Um, it's one of those mysteries. But given that there are quite a lot of them there now and that they have survived the three broods because it's a double brooded um, insect, we felt we had to acknowledge that in the annual report. And indeed, I'm acknowledging it now. Uh, interestingly, in 2020, they've managed to spread over a large area of Thurfield Heath, so not just the one ideal bit of uh, Church Hill, but they're actually seen right across onto the rifle range, not that far from the clubhouse. Um, so flying, flying um, both in the, in the spring and in the summer. So, um, you know, one has to be a bit ambivalent about that because butterfly conservation isn't a great supporter of unauthorized introductions um, or uh, but there we go it has to be noted every year we get a few oddities and um, we just don't know whether these are natural occurrences 
or what? So let's just have a look at what we got in 2020. <clears throat> the Camberwell Beauty, or as Brian would call it from North America, the morning cloak, uh, is quite common on the continent um, in places like Denmark and occasionally does actually come over here as a natural migrant. Uh, a few years ago, there were about 20 or 30 records in Hertfordshire, but there were only a couple of records this year, and it's impossible to know whether they were natural migrants, though there was no great migrant movement, or whether they were things that people had bred and they'd either released or had escaped. Um, my inclination is that they were probably were the latter. Now, marsh fritillary is not a butterfly that is associated with Hertfordshire, but again, one was seen up at Thurfield Heath, which is in fact the one from Andy Symes' photo in the middle there, and a couple were seen down in southwest Middlesex. And when I got in touch with recorders for all the surrounding counties in the southeast, there were one or two other records which popped up um, in odd places um, in several of the counties. So whether someone was going around releasing odd ones here or there, here and there, we just don't know. It's all very odd. The fact that the first one we knew about was at Thurfield Heath, not a million miles from where the Adonis Blues occurred, um, yeah, may or may not be coincidence. Then at the bottom there, we've got the swallowtail. Now the swallowtail in Britain is really only native in uh, parts of the Norfolk Broads and there is another, another, it's a special subspecies, the continental subspecies, which is common in Europe, um, which is the, the photograph down below, is the one that is often seen if it's recorded um, in, in inland southern England. They do sometimes. Um, and there was a report of two or three in um, some fields, some bean fields, um, in the middle of nowhere, basically near, near to, but not that close to much Haddam. Uh, this year, and uh, that's what the two dots are, because it's actually right on the border of two, 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 two kilometer squares. So they're actually the only the same two or three butterflies, but they happen to move around from one square to another, depending on who who recorded them. Um, so they're almost certainly a release or an escape. The long tail blue is slightly different. Um, we get a few records each year, and they have been known to breed in London. There were a couple of colonies in the 1990s in inner London. Um, most usually seen now indoors where people have bought beans or peas from East Africa and have found the caterpillar inside those and either kept it to see what it does or discarded them in disgust and the thing has pupated and then there's a <clears throat> emerged in the house um, and it's the attractive and very common European species, the long tail blue. Again, these do sometimes reach the south coast of England naturally and uh, have been known to breed there. But given that we're some way from the south coast, most of ours are actual ac accidental imports. OK, let's move on to the moths because we're giving the butterflies a good run. So in 2020, and you'll see here that there's a, a lot more movement and vibrancy in moth species. In fact, there are 13 new species recorded for Hertfordshire and two for Middlesex. Um, many other species recorded for the first time. Um, and unfortunately, there are declines and uh, increases just like there are for butterflies. So let's have a look at a bit of detail. So here's a few new species uh, for Hertfordshire. And uh, the map's a slightly different format because of the format of the, uh, the database. So the way that most people's recording of moths tends to be at light traps in their back gardens. So whereas people will go out and about for butterflies, for night flying moths, the records tend to indicate where recorders are based. And you'll see for the oak rustic, for instance, in Hertfordshire, two dots close to each other. Hertfordshire is the yellow bit. And surprise, surprise, they are the gardens of me and this good year. We did get through a lot of recording last year. And the oak rustic is a species that's been gradually spreading. And you can see there are a few records in Middlesex as well. Not the most exciting looking moth, it's an autumnal flyer. And then the black spotted chestnut, which again is very much confined to the uh, to East Hertfordshire at the moment. There are one or two other records since uh, this map was put together. And this is a winter flying moth, flies from 
late November, December, January and into February. Um, and that again is a moth which seems to be increasing across the country um, in, in Southeast England anyway. And then two rather more spectacular moths, Spurge hawk moth, of which the only record we have so far was by John O'Forgan. We found this one in a gutter in Bishop Stortford. How it had got there, whether it had been released or whatever, because the Spurge hawk moth is a migrant, big spectacular migrant hawk moth, which has a big spectacular, but not migrant, uh, caterpillar, as you can see from that photo. And then the Sallow clear wing, which was added to the list by Liz, um, Basically, the, the clear wings are moths, that, uh, as I mentioned in my talk about moths, we attract using pheromones. And Liz just happened to put one out for the sallow clear wing and the hope, you know, see what, see what it attracted because never been recorded in Hertfordshire before. <coughs> and lo and behold, the sallow clear wing turned up. So you never know what you're going to find. And then we've got the... Uh, Clifton Dumperi, which is Britain's biggest moth by sort of wing area. Um, I, you may have seen photos of it sitting in my hand on um, other talks in other places. Uh, blue underwing moth flies in late summer. And this established itself in Kent between the wars and then died out. But it seems to have been able to come back into Britain in recent years. And you can see from the map below but there are now quite a lot of records from the last five years, which are the purple squares, across quite a broad swathe of Hertfordshire, which suggests it may be establishing itself, and uh, quite quite a quite a moth to get established in our area. And so we have some other establishing spe um, species, and these are related. We've got the L. Alban Wayne Scott and the White Point. Now both of these are in the same family. Um, the L. Alban wainscot was very, very rare until a few years ago, well, last two or three years, but now seems to be making headway in from the east because that's where there were populations before. You can see the records are all on the east side of Hertfordshire and Middlesex. The, um, the White Point was a migrant um, until two or three years ago, you wouldn't have expected to see it and apart from good migrant years. But that map represents, all those squares just represent records from the last five years. And you can see it's now pretty well distributed across much of Hertfordshire and Middlesex. So that's a, something which has come in, started to breed and has found the conditions in Britain now very conducive to its uh, being able to thrive. A few more moths that have established themselves across the county um, and are still doing well in 2020. <clears throat> the coronets um, and the toe flax brocade have been around for a few years now, and I have talked about them in other talks about how they've established, but they're gradually spreading across the county, as is the tree lichen beauty, which occurs in all sorts of different um, colour forms, as you can see from the photo down there, and Metalampra italica, which is a small micro moth, but again, quite, quite a distinctive micro moth, both in shape and coloration. And these are all moths, which uh, no reason to believe won't become more and more common. And the good old Jersey tiger, as I say, from Devon and the Channel Islands to Hertfordshire and Middlesex, so very different. And you can see the, the spread clearly on that map. You can see that virtually all the squares show that the latest record has been in the last five years and how it has spread up from London, particularly the eastern side of London into particularly the eastern or the southeastern quarter of Hertfordshire, but beginning to be seen all over the county. And so it continues its march northwards across not just Hertfordshire and Middlesex, but across much of southern England. And so species which was always regarded as very exotic is now a common day flying and night flying moth. And one of uh, Liz, Co Liz Goodyear's famous um, multiple catches of Jersey Tigers can be seen on the top of her moth trap one morning uh, last year. And uh, you, you can see that they can turn up and be present in very great numbers. 
So let's have a look at some moths that aren't doing so well. All of these moths dropped in numbers quite considerably in 2020. And um, <coughs> excuse me, some of them have been dropping off in numbers, possibly from previous high points. So they may just be dropping back to where they would not the numbers they would normally be seen in. It's difficult to tell. Um, but we have the common marbled carpet. I'm going top left across the common Quaker, which is a moth that's flying now, though not in huge numbers because of the cold nights we're getting. The buff ermine, which became very common a few years ago, but now seems to be going back. And it may be, as I said, that was just a, a local peak and it's just dropping back to normal numbers. Another moth the flying now, the clouded drab at the bottom left, then the spectacular swallow-tailed moth, and then the mouse moth, which has not dropped in numbers quite considerably over the last uh, few years, um, possibly the atypical little brown moth. But uh, it's whether they're, whether they're spectacular like swallow-tailed moth or very dull, dingy like the uh, mouse moth, we hope that we're not going to lose any of those from our county fauna. But equally, there were moths which are common, which rose in numbers. Um, we've got the lunar underwing, which is a common uh, autumn moth. The heart and dart, which uh, flies in the spring. And that, those, its numbers dropped off a few years ago. But over the last two or three years, they've been rising up. And there were very good numbers in 2020. The straw underwing, which is a uh, late summer, early autumn moth, which has been uh, increasing in numbers over the last few years. You can't see the underwing in that picture, but it is a straw, yellowy straw colour. And the common wainscot, which whose numbers do come and go a bit uh, over the years, but it seems to be on an upward trend at the moment. And uh, that's really all I want to say about uh, the records for the last year. So this small elephant hawk moth is preparing for takeoff as we need to prepare for takeoff for the 2021 season. And there's a privet hawk moth doing the same thing. So thank you very much for listening and uh, very happy to take any questions that anyone's got. I have a question, but I'll wait. Uh, Malcolm's had trouble with this. Uh, he's dropped out. I don't know if Malcolm is back. So he's asked me to um, let's deal with the questions. I don't know. Um, hold on. Let me just try and get a better view of what's going. Hello, Brian. Hold on. Let Hi. me. Right. Can you, hear, can you hear me? Yeah, that's better. Is Malcolm back in? No, he isn't, is he? Right, Brian, can you go ahead with your question? Yes, this is my question. Um, in uh, Massachusetts, where I live, uh, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of painted ladies are released every year by teachers and homeschoolers and all those. They, they buy the caterpillars, they raise the butterflies, and then they release them out into the wild. And when there is no perceptible flight of painted ladies, none of those butterflies is seen by any recorder. They, they just disappear into the landscape. So my question is, when you find a morning cloak, a uh, Camberwell beauty, and you attribute it to somebody letting it go, what are the odds that somebody actually let it go and that a recorder found it? I, I, I wrote to Andrew that in Massachusetts that would be zero. But I, so I, you know, when you let a butterfly go out your door, the chances are that nobody's ever going to see it again. I, th I think that's probably true, but we are, you've got to remember, particularly um, Middlesex, an extremely densely populated area. Yes. <clears throat> and so, Things are more likely to wander off and turn up in people's back gardens. Um, and the fact is that, you know, when you compare the odd one that turns up, there may well be more that people, as you say, just disappear into thin air. People don't see right. the birds get or they get squashed on the road. There's plenty of chance but, of that in London. Plus, we uh, have 50, 50 uh -huh. dedicated recorders. We have 50 dedicated recorders and you had 4,000. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there are various stages of dedication, but there are a number, several of whom are on this call, extremely dedicated recorders. I mean, for something like the Camberwell Beauty, because it's a migrant, if 
there aren't lots of records of it coming in across the East Coast, then it's highly unlikely that there, the odd one has managed to fly, overfly 50 or 80 miles of Britain before it comes to land in an unlikely place like uh, built up London. Okay. okay. We, we, have the, just, we have the same problem with people releasing painted ladies um, and so on in this country. Yeah. And we, we get monarch records because of being released for weddings and funerals and so on. Um, I've noticed in the um, chat, um, Dick Ashford has commented that you are photographing moths on leaves. Mm -hmm. um, I know that I try occasionally to get my moths to pose, but you seem to be very successful there. Um, <laughs> yes, you don't see photographs, obviously, the ones that got away, the ones yeah. that dis disappear into the kitchen, <coughs> excuse me, and never to be seen again, and where they go, I don't know. Um, it's a case of sticking, with a lot of moths, sticking them in, in the pot in the fridge for a little while, um, to try and cool them down, make them less active. But sometimes you can make them so inactive that they're quite obviously inactive moths. Their antennae don't stick out um, and their legs don't stick out. And so you end up with a, ra a rather artificial looking um, moth. Yeah. But I mean, I've been doing it for quite a number of years and I, I guess you just, you yeah, just it's get the, the same thing. Yeah. <clears throat> it's obviously putting them in the fridge, which isn't, isn't approved of in my house. My wife is not listening. <laughs> so. oh, my wife is listening and uh, yeah, she doesn't think I, I, I don't. I know when um, some, some of the children lived at home, their friends would come to get something out of the fridge and would be absolutely appalled to find pots of moth sitting there. Some <laughs> of course, some, much more appalled than our children were. Yeah, well, sometimes, my... sometimes the moths get very active even in the fridge and after all moths that fly at night at this time of year are not really put off by being put in the fridge because no. sometimes it's warmer in there than it is outside. <laughs> <laughs> my daughter compares notes with Simon Knott's daughter about moths in the fridge. They find it quite amusing that uh, mm. both our parents, both their parents keep their moths in the fridge. But there's um, Dave Howden <laughs> I um, wanted to know whether there's been any useful data on the ratio of the two colour forms of Jersey Tiger. And I commented that um, I know I should count the difference, but it's sometimes a lot harder than um, it seems, especially as I'm just trying to count them before they fly away. Generally speaking, my garden, there, there are both colours, but generally more red to yellow. But um, one day I will try, honest. Well, I don't know how Andrew gets on with counting the differences. Yeah, well, I, I don't get as many as you do. I mean, I think the most I've ever had in one night was about 35, which is about 100 <laughs> fewer than you. Um, I do try and count the differences. And I know historically down in Devon and the Channel Islands, the, the yellow form was reckoned to be quite rare, probably fewer than 10% of the population. But I would say here, it's not quite the same. It's I would say it's probably about 20% of the population are yellow and 80% are red. Um, so the, the ratio is definitely closer than it is in the original wild populations. Why that should be, I have absolutely no idea. Okay, I've got another question or another comment from Chris Newman. He says, I thought you'd mention the silver wash for tillery. On one of my first Brickett Wood walks, Malcolm Howe got very excited when one was seen and said they'd been in extinct in Hertfordshire, now they're unmissable. I think perhaps it's because they're now yeah. I'm losing relatively yeah. common, but um, they, any, th any thoughts, Andrew? Yeah, well, they are. I mean, that is the thing that they, they I mean, they were, they were extinct in Hertfordshire and Middlesex and they started coming back in <clears throat> in 2003. Brickett Wood was the sort of the point at which they really started to get breeding. That's the first breeding area, I think. Um, and they are now extremely well distributed across the counties. Um, pretty well, any bit of woodland, but especially ones that obviously has violets in it for the breeding, tends to have them present, even fairly small pieces of woodland. And particularly in southern Hertfordshire and northwest Middlesex, we do have a lot of quite large woodlands. Um, but, you know, they travel around. And you know, in the last two or three years, they've become a garden butterfly as well. We've had them on, just sitting on Budlier in our back garden, which is a, 
a suburban garden surrounded by other suburban gardens and quite a long way from the nearest areas where they breed, probably a good half mile from the nearest woodland where I'm pretty sure they do breed. So they're very mobile insects. Um, so it's one of the big successories. I don't think, I, I didn't feature them in the sort of butterflies of 2020, simply because they have become rather ubiquitous now. Not to, um, not that I've got anything against the silver wash fritillary. Um, another comment about going back to the moths in the fridge. Um, Nick Wilson said it was quite common to find them in his uh, my dad always had pots of moths in the fridge when I visit. We're used to it. But Peter Chapman says um, he was, I don't think he was, does putting a moth in a fridge harm them? I think he, I think he just wants to check that out. No, it doesn't. I mean, the one thing you shouldn't do is put the moth in the fridge for a bit, photograph it and then throw it straight outside. You've got to give it time to warm up. And indeed, it often needs a few minutes to warm. You've got to catch it at the moment when it's cold enough to not be wanting to fly, but warm enough that it looks natural. Um, it, it, you know, it, it's, tr it's trial and error. Um, and sometimes you don't get it right and off they zoom. Um, you know, if you see a moth beginning, excuse me, to shiver its wings, you know you're too late. You might as well put it back in the pot for a bit to calm down. But no, there's no evidence. I mean, the moths can survive quite easily for about seven, eight days in a fridge. If they're in reasonable, because obviously if it had moths on its last legs, it was going to die outside, the same as it would die in the fridge. But yeah, basically a week for most moths is fine. Um, and I must admit that for one or two moths, I actually give them a couple of minutes in the freezer just to cool them down. Anyway. Not, not enough to kill them, I hasten to add, but that can sometimes just knock off their rather wild tendencies. Um, but I always make sure that they're warmed up a bit before I let them. I don't usually let moths go until the evening and then let them go in fairly dense cover in our front garden if they're ones that I've caught um, in, the, in the back garden so that they, you know, they're well away from the light and less likely to be recaptured. And little experiments I've done with marking but moths does suggest that very few that you let go in the front garden get recaptured in the back garden the same night. Right, Malcolm is back. Can you, are you um, able to read everything now, Malcolm? No, I, I've, uh, my broadband seems to have collapsed, so I've rejoined on my phone, so I can't, can't see any of the uh, controls or anything. So could right. you keep going, Liz? Um, righty ho. Um, I assume you had a poll ready, didn't you? I did, but I don't think I'm going to be able to operate it. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> oh, well. Hey ho, we're not... Anyway, um, go... Going back to silver wash fritillary, uh, comments that uh, it is D, isn't it? Um, it's turned up in the in a North Ten Garden and Alley Pally Park. David Solomon's many on Hampstead Heath, and Dave had been going back to the calming of the moth says sometimes I use a CO two spray to anaesthetise them, then instead, and then. Hold on, my now my internet's unstable. Uh, hold on, uh, and then uh, Dick is saying leaving them in egg boxes in a bucket in a secluded place. Uh, I think everyone has different ways of looking after their moths before taking photos. Um, the more sophisticated use give them a sort of quick dose of anaesthetic, whereas I haven't quite got that. Yeah, got that I know far. the CO, but, yeah, the uh, CO2 yeah. from the sort of soda stream. Uh, is, an, is another common way of um, calming. It's not something that I've tried, I must admit, um, because the fridge is there and it's free. I don't have to buy the CO2 capsules. So, um, but yeah, absolutely nothing wrong with that. And I mean, sometimes you like, I mean, some of the moths that are on leaves, not seeing the photos there, are ones that you do actually see sitting on leaves. Sometimes if you come across, <clears throat> you're lucky enough to come across a night flying moth that's actually sitting on a leaf in plain view out in the countryside and then clearly you can get a nice natural photograph uh, in those circumstances. I mean the other, the other main problem is finding a leaf that's big enough so that when you take the photographs you don't get a bit of the background in it, you know, you get a bit of the, the kitchen work surface or um, something like that and I have resorted to just sometimes sticking them on bits of white or grey card just to get a record shot 
um, you know, it's the more artistic thing, if, if possible, just to get them photographed as something that looks vaguely natural. Oh, and um, Kate says her husband's seen a silver wash fritillary near his office in Southwark. Yeah. But um, one of the best moths for sitting, finding in the countryside during the day is the dusky sallow because it likes to sit on flower heads. That's, I found quite a few as I was doing my walks last year. So that's, that's quite a nice treat. Yeah, it's a that, pretty that's good. Well. They don't tend to move around very much, even though they're in, in plain view. I think I had a photo of one in my moth talk uh, doing doing that very thing, and I think they're they're probably a moth which is increasing its distribution across the county a bit more than it was or was a chalkland moth. It does seem to go now wherever there's um, knapweed, particularly the greater knapweed growing. Um, Can I ask a question, please? Yeah. Um, I think I saw a white admiral, or a couple maybe, in Rippendall Woods in Watford. Would that be likely? Oh yeah, yeah, that's one of the known sites for uh, for white admiral. Oh. So certainly, yeah, Whippendale, Whippendale Woods, is not, that's not a surprise at all. It's nice to hear of another record from there. Yeah, I, I must say I didn't send it in, but if I see another one, I will. <laughs> Yes, please, please do. I mean, that's something I'd appeal to everyone about. Whatever, whatever you see, doesn't matter if you think it's really common, please, please do report it by one of the many means that I outlined um, at the start of my talk. <clears throat> Unlike birds, where there tends to be a tendency not to be too worried about records of common things, butterflies or any insect is different, and I'm interested in any record from anywhere of anything. It will never... No record is too trivial to be submitted. <laughs> can, I, can I make another comment? Um, mm. It might be a bit of a, um, a big ask, but that little map you had with all the towns marked on was really useful to me because I'm not that geographical. And when I look at a map of Hertfordshire, I don't know where anything is. <laughs> you know, I just wondered whether you couldn't include a map towns on in that uh, in the summary that you send out yeah. right yes um until about three years ago we did um because that's what it was originally i originally put it together for unfortunately or fortunately um we keep getting new species of butterfly in heart this year so i had to find two pa new pages for the brown stop oh, right. yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> for the brown hair streak um, and the Adonis blue. So I had to cut down some of the preliminary material. And one of the things that fell by the wayside was that map. Um, we'd have to increase the number of pages in the annual report. And um, I don't know if we can afford to do that. And then, of course, that would be one more page. And then I have to find it, material to fill up the other three pages, which I expect I could do. Um, but yeah, I, I completely agree with what you're saying, Christine. But something, something had to give, and it was that map. Can you re-show the uh, that slide with the with the map and the uh, butterfly recordings? Just re-show it now, because you can I'll take have a, a go. You take a screenshot on your computer, you will have it. We were going to put it on the website because when the report came out, I actually had somebody email this specific question, and um, we were sorting out the map to put it on the website. But that doesn't appear to have happened. We got it was in discussion because. It had been commented on. Yeah, hang on. I'm just going to try and share the screen. And that's going yeah, to... I'd like to take it. Uh, that's great. Yeah, thank you. That's fine. I've taken a screenshot, which I can okay. trim. And... Right, I'll move it up. <clears throat> out the way. Mm. Okay, thank you. That's okay. I mean, talking about records turning up, it was on Twitter today, and it doesn't relate to... Hertfordshire, but um, somebody was out dog walking in Suffolk in a wood which I've looked for purple emperors many times before. It just happened he was talking to the dog walker very recently and they said, oh, I've got a photo of a female purple emperor from 2019. And all of a sudden, they now have know that purple emperors are in that wood. Now, 
it's just pure chance that this dog walker happened to be interested, well, the person walking happened to be interested in Purple Empress, and then this lady shows him this picture on her phone. Um, and the phone has made such a difference to records because when we have instant confirmation that, you know, what somebody has seen, it has revolutionised um, the uh, recording of some of the rarer species, without doubt. Mm. Yes, that's, that's one thing to sort of, sort of reiterate. Putting a record on Facebook or Twitter does not make it a record, an official record. It needs to be, we just haven't, I just haven't, many recorders just haven't got the time to monitor all the possible social media sites where records might appear. They really need to come to us by one of the many means that uh, I outlined at the beginning of the talk. Yeah, I mean, I had this similar thing that someone sent post up a picture of a Valenzina um, form of the Silverwash Fritillary on a Facebook page, nothing to do with butterflies. Um, and that hadn't been reported anywhere else. And it just happened that I, there's a group that I subscribed to. So I, I saw it. So there's probably equally interesting things on groups that, um, that I don't subscribe to. But if no one puts them in, in, in any official way, then we just don't know about them. Yeah, I'd like to echo that because you remember you told me about the large tortoiseshell in Cornwall. Yeah. And when I followed it up with the Cornwall BC recorder, he hadn't heard of it. And I think he uh, has now. Obviously, I've made him aware of it. But So we shall wait and see um, how that plays out. Yeah, no, that's a very good example. OK, are there any more questions? <laughs> it gone quiet? I think Malcolm is is listening but he can't easily contribute. Um, I'd just like to say thank you to Andrew for a very interesting talk. I, I quite appreciate being mentioned a few times. <laughs> um, and um, well apart from the fact that our next meeting is as Malcolm mentioned the Members Day with the AGM. I'm sorry about that but we do have to go through a few formalities. That's on the 27th of March. In the morning it's the National Recorders meeting so I'm going to be zoomed out by the end of the day. Um, there's just sufficient time to have something to eat between the two meetings um, and then of course we've got this second, this final talk by popular demand on the 31st of March and that will probably end our season of talks but we are trying to prepare a of walks program it's still a bit in balance because we don't really know what the government's going to throw at us and how many people we can allow on these walks and we may have to implement booking systems just so that we don't have too many people turn up but it, we are trying to prepare some walks put it that way and um i don't know have, andrew have you got anything more to say um no i don't think so no i think i've said can i ask is the agm going to be recorded like these meetings? It should be, that is the plan. Um, as again, you know, if you've missed a bit of tonight's, you can always watch it. Uh, the, it is the intention to record it. Every now and then we do have a few glitches. And I mean, I don't know what's happened possibly now with Malcolm's internet dropping, whether he was recording it on his computer or whether it was being recorded remotely. We'll find that one out when he comes to find out what's on his recording. Um, but yeah, I was supposed to be able to do, be a, a sort of joint host tonight, but I managed to log in incorrectly. So that was another thing I did wrong. But um, anyway, I think we're nearly there. What is the time? Oh, it's quarter past nine. It's nearly our bedtime. Brian's just waking up. But yes. um, <laughs> so um, I think that's probably all. We would have had a poll, um, but sadly, that's gone. We'll leave that one for the next one. But um, I see a lot. Of, I do every time so try and keep a note of the names. And I think this week we've got some different names every week. You know, probably I reckon there's probably been eight or so people that have joined us for the last how many weeks? Two months since we started this program of talks. And I think we'll probably try and do it next winter as well. Just have to try and find some topics to talk about. So if anyone's got any ideas that you would like us to talk about next year, I know it's a year away, please drop us a line because we gives us time to think about it. Okay, so I'm going to leave. Um, I'll say good night to everyone. And thank you again, Andrew. And thank you all for joining in. 
and listening. Um, I'm going to go. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Thank you, Andrew. Bye. 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 Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank Bye. you Bye. Bye. Bye.